Uh -huh. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Mika. I use they, them pronouns, and I am one of the co-directors of the San Francisco Disability Cultural Center. Uh, we also recognize that it is election day today, um, and this is being recorded, so we understand if you need to drop your question in the chat, in the question and answer box, and, and leave us to go fill out your, your ballot. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time. Uh, we're going to start out um, really excited to share a little bit more with you about the Disability Cultural Center. Uh, we'll be showing you some preliminary renderings um, from the architects and um, some of the feedback that we've gotten from our focus groups. And then we're going to open it up to your questions and comments, thoughts and hopes for the center. Um, so just a few access notes. Welcome, first of all, we hope you can, you can get comfy with us um, as we talk about the Disability Cultural Center. Um, for stream text captions, please visit um, the following URL. It's tinyurl.com um, forward slash long more captions, which Emily has just put in the chat. Um, the chat function is turned off, but please use the Q&A like it's a chat space. Um, and for anyone who wants access to the Q&A afterwards, please email Emily at emily at disabilityculturalcenter.org. If you want to ask a question verbally or in ASL, please use the raised hand function and we'll promote you to a panelist and we'll, you will be able to share your video and or your audio. And finally, for access or tech assistance, please send a direct message to Emily um, a lot more Institute host. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Emily to talk about what brought us to this moment. Hi, everyone. So my name is Emily. I'm with the Longmore Institute on Disability. I serve as interim director there. Um, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm, I'm excited to be with you and to be part of this project. Um, so a little bit of history of how this came to be. Um, I'm going to move move fast through a lot of stuff, but uh, it's all to say that like we get to be the operators of something that has been many, many people behind the scenes working for for some time uh, that, that far predates us. So we really want to express our gratitude to all the many players who've been working behind the scenes to get us to this point. Um, in 2016, it started with the city of San Francisco passing Prop I with 66% of the vote, which created a dignity fund to support the needs of older adults and people with disabilities living in San Francisco. Um, after those funds were set in place and the Department of Disability and Aging Services was set to um, lead efforts to, to manage those funds as well as a, a community um, alliance, uh, they did a needs assessment in 2018 and they found that um, there was inadequate service for people with disabilities. Uh, in particular, there were a lot of opportunities for people with disabilities to be served if they went into existing centers for seniors, but not a lot of opportunity um, to, to directly kind of center on disability. And um, that was a, a moment of you know, thinking and contemplation for the city. And, um, the mayor's office on disability uh, in together with the department of disability and aging services um, really brewed up this plan of well, what if we had a disability cultural center that could um, be you know part of the city's rich web of many different um, centers cultural centers that support some of the the population's um, more marginalized identities and communities uh, to give them a place for culture to foster and grow and networks to happen. Um, and with that idea, it 
continue to grow and grow. In 2018, um, the Department of Disability and Aging Services hired the Longmore Institute, um, and we were tasked with developing a strategic plan for the, the cultural center and did a, a really big amount of research at that point to do a survey and a number of different focus groups to really center on trying to hear not just from the usual suspects who we could count on to come out, but a, a very diverse disability population in San Francisco. Um, and we had a team of advisors who uh, helped serve that process and, and gave a lot of information and, um, and came up with mission and vision statement at that time. And from there, um, we created this plan for like what the city should, should do for the next step. And then we know things got a little wild after that point in time and things were very still as the pandemic happened. And so it was really exciting for a lot of us who've been waiting and hoping to see this move forward to see the city reissue a RFP in 2023. That's a request for proposals um, to be the, who wanted to actually be the operators to get this thing moving. And that when we did the work in 2018, it was very uncertain where this was gonna be and what it was gonna look like and how big it was gonna be. And now we know all that. And so we're gonna share some of those very specific things of, of what it actually looks like with you today. Um, so our contract has started as of January, 2024. Um, and that is a collaboration between the Haven of Hope and the Longmore Institute uh, led by Haven of Hope with Longmore as a subcontractor supporter. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna introduce my colleague, Damani. Hi, my name is Damani Hardin. Uh, I am the Director of Information Technology at the LC and Lily Cox Haven of Hope, also known as the Haven of Hope. Um, as you can see there, that's our team. We are a small but mighty team, definitely a force to be reckoned with. Uh, and I'm on. I'm here representing the leadership of the organization um, and our fearless leader. Her name is Darcel, Dr. Darcel Lar. She's sitting right there in the middle, holding the beautiful baby. And a little bit about uh, the Haven of Hope. Um, I want to express kind of the vision and the mission of the organization. So it kind of highlights why the DCC uh, partnered with Haven of Hope to really move this project forward and. and began to set up this cultural center. So the vision uh, to experience a world in which all individuals, regardless of race, disability, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, creed, personal history, education, economic context, or social status, enjoy equitable opportunity and the support to cope, heal, and flourish to their fullest potential. We aim to rejoice in a world where all people live free of conflict over race, disability, ethnicity, gender, religion, and sexual orientation. A world where differences are celebrated and humanity is the uniting theme. That's a pretty ambitious vision, as you can tell. Our mission is to improve the quality of life in the traditionally underserved communities through dedicated human service and economic development programs. Our programs support the well being and the emotional, spiritual, and professional growth of individuals, families, and communities. And as you can see, these missions, this vision, this mission aligns directly with the DCC, the Disability Cultural Center, and Haven of Hope is fully committed and very proud to be a part of this experience. Thank you. Thank you, Damani. I um, mean, just a quick image description. Oh, he, you covered the image description of the baby, but you know, this shows an image of our of the Haven of Hope team, um, which includes um, everybody you're gonna hear from today, except for Darcel, who's unable to join us. And yeah, sitting around a dining room table um, and holding one of our teammates, Sandra's very cute little one. Next slide. So I'm gonna introduce my organization, the Longmore Institute at San Francisco State University. Um, our mission is to study and showcase disabled people's experiences in order to revolutionize social views. 
through public education, scholarship, and cultural events, the Institute shares disability history and theory, promotes critical thinking, and builds a broader community. So I have some images on this slide that show the types of programs that we um, are known for that are really centering in disability culture. We aim to have some really joyful programs such as Superfest, the film festival we run, things that center on the expertise of disabled people and uh, boost the work of disability justice uh, scholar activists and disability studies scholars. Um, and that really look to find ways to incorporate students with disabilities into all the work that we do. Next slide. Hello. Oh, go ahead, Emily. No, I was just going to introduce you. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Sandra, and my pronouns are she, her, ellas. And I am the CRM and impact manager for the TCC. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I wanted to tell you about um, the TCC's mission, which is by providing educational, artistic, and social networking opportunities, the San Francisco Disability Community, Community Cultural Center brings diverse people with disabilities together to access resources advance social justice and foster disability culture, community and pride. And our vision is that we envision a city with a strong sense of disability culture and identity, where the people with disabilities who live, work and visit actively engage in the services and supports available to them, fully participate in civic life and feel valued and proud of who they are. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dagny Brown. I am a co-director of the Disability Cultural Center, and I am so excited. Um, I use she and they pronouns. I'm so excited to share a few of the renderings that we've been working um, with the architects and the Kelsey that's going to be the home of the DCC. Um, and so just a note that these are put together by a wonderful team of architects who are still learning a lot about access. And so some of the things might be like head scratchy. Why, why is that stool so inaccessible or something like that? And it's something that we're working uh, with them on. So all notes and comments are absolutely welcome. Um, and know that we know these are far from perfection, but exciting nonetheless. Um, all right. So uh, we are going to be located at the Kelsey Civic Center, which is right on the corner of Grove and Van Ness in San Francisco. It's an affordable housing complex that's disability forward. So the units are going to be 25% reserved for people with disabilities. It's going to be a mix of studios and two bedrooms. There will be a lottery system for selecting residents, which I believe will be opening soon, so we're not involved with that. And it's a uh, very near Civic Center and BART and Van Ness Muni. Uh, so the next slide. So this is um, the most current rendering of what you'll see when you walk into the Disability Cultural Center. So we, as you can see, we have a lot of plants, some vibrant colors, um, and our big aim here, and this is what we've heard in a lot of our focus groups, is to really make it a cozy, homey space where folks, um, that really combat sort of the institutional feel of things. So you can see here that we've got a library with graphic novels and zines um, by disabled writers and artists. We have rotating art by disabled, rotating art by disabled artists. Um, and then you'll see these little inaccessible stools, cute, but no. Um, but yeah, so this is just a cozy little entryway. So this room here is uh, what we call a community meeting room. And right now there's a long table in the middle with 
uniform chairs. Those are all going and it's gonna be a cozy, quiet, flexible lounge space um, with a door with sound insulation. So this room could be reserved or rented on a sliding scale by community groups that need a space to meet. During larger events, it will turn into kind of a quiet, low stimulation zone. Um, again, you see there's a lot of plants um, and cozy little bench window seats uh, full of light and um, yeah. All right. So the next slide is a view from above. And what you see is a large room with about 50 chairs in it facing towards a big screen and, um, and a courtyard area. So this is the setup that it would be for like a film screening or a speaker series or something. Of course, we know that Every body is gonna be different. So we will not be having 50 uniform chairs. Um, there's a nice big bathroom that will have an adult changing table in it. And again, you can see the little side room would be for a quiet area. And one of the things we're really excited about is the wall that leads into the courtyard where we have a patio area will completely open so that events can be indoor and outdoor simultaneously. And we can really uh, welcome and have a space of belonging for folks that can't be inside. And we can be able to host events um, for our whole community. So we're very excited about that. Um, and this is a setup where uh, would be like kind of the flexible space. You see lots of different kinds of furniture. Um, and everything's white in this picture. Not everything will be white, I promise you. Uh, these are just rendering. So on a weekday when folks might be able to come in and just chat, meet up, have a cup of coffee, play a game, what have you. So this is more just the cozy setup that we'll generally see. Um, this is another view of that. So it's kind of a long room with lots of natural light, um, again, facing the screen, the cozy chairs, you can kind of see um, a big chair that is kind of enclosed. It creates a little nook-like space. So we'll have a couple of those. And again, with the big plants, and you can kind of see to the left, that wall that folds away onto the, onto the patio. Um, and then we also have this big wall. Right now it looks like there's a screen on it. The screen would be retractable and we look forward to having a gallery wall full of art by disabled artists. And um, just another view of that same space kind of standing from where a speaker would stand in front of the screen. And you can see there's a little kitchenette with a sink and the library area and the view of Grove Street. And I'm going to pass it to Mika now to talk about the planning phase. Neat. So we're in the planning phase right now until we launch in the virtual phase in July. And during this time, we're meeting with key disability leaders. We've met with over 20 so far. Um, we're connecting with other values aligned organizations. Um, we've been researching and mapping the existing resources and assembling our advisory council. And as um, Dagny alluded to, we've been meeting weekly with the design team about the brick and mortar space. And then finally, which I'll talk about a little bit more on the next few slides, we've been facilitating focus groups. Um, and for the focus groups, we- the image description. Oh, yes. And for um, the, the image that we have on this slide is of the three co-directors, myself, Emily and Dagny, and we're smiling at the camera right on Grove Street in front of the construction site on a crisp, sunny winter day. Um, really excited to see the progress that has been made and it looks like four stories in the background. 
And here we have another image on this next slide that shows um, one of our focus groups. So this was a focus group with transitional age youth and um, eight people are sitting around the table with lots of snacks and Emily, is, and they're looking at Emily, who's facilitating a focus group for, for the transitional age youth. Um, so our, our goal for the, these focus groups are to go in a little bit more depth about um, people's feedback for the center, their hopes and dreams, and really also centering marginalized groups within disability. Um, so we've done all but one of the focus groups, um, a, one for Black, Indigenous, people of color and disabled, LGBTQIA+, um, unhoused or formerly unhoused, um, systems impacted, so that covers a lot of different institutions um, and jails and prisons, um, one in ASL and one in Spanish. Um, one with veterans, and as you see in the picture, one with the transition age youth, and we have our final focus group, which will focus on queer and trans, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color within disability. And we wanted to share just a few of the key findings, um, first related to the physical location. And Dagny's talked a little bit about this, but you know, people just want to feel a really homey space. Um, some mentioned music, like a place of belonging where they could come to de-stress, maybe study. Um, folks wanted bright colors to set the mood, weren't as into the dark renderings we showed. One person said, I like the lights, I like the plants, the feeling of being outside allows me the support I need. Um, others mention noise canceling headphones and a front desk that allows you to check stuff out and go to a low stim area and, um, and creating like a cozy lounge, um, for when people to need to decompress. And then finally, we heard a lot about representation within the DCC staff that having diverse representation, whether it be in race, disability, um, gender, sexuality, to name just a few, um, is really important for what folks are looking for um, within representation of the DCC team. On the next slide, we see two young disabled folks um, crafting together, they're creating some clothes as part of a workshop. Um, and that's, um, this slide is about events and gatherings. So that's one thing people mentioned again and again was maker, artist and craft spaces, whether virtual or in person. Um, having a community cultural calendar where where everyone can go to see what's happening within disability culture and community. Um, and then activities related to community building, um, such as Cafe Crip, which is already in existence, um, a d and club, disability focused support groups and, and affinity groups. For example, um, disabled women vets, queer speed or slow dating and others. Um, we also really heard the need for services and resource referrals. So while we're really focusing on the DCC as a cultural space, um, we heard the, the essential need to have pop-ups and be able to refer folks to um, the right resources. Um, social entrepreneurship training is another and online speaker series in disability studies and disability justice. And of course, performances like Disability and Drag, Access Happy Hour, and much, much more. And I'm going to turn it over to Emily now. Yeah. So uh, we'll be collecting Q&A from you in just a moment and, and making time for more dialogue. Um, I know from the focus groups that we've been running, 
that we'll, we'll be receiving a lot of questions about a few things. And so we can kind of share uh, the, the messy place we're working in right now uh, and, and, and some of the stuff that, that is still underway. Um, we are really thinking of this as like a membership sort of situation, which means that if people are coming in and using the space, um, we know that there's going to be some community agreements that will be very core to like before you can fully have access to the space, you have to kind of do a little onboarding. Uh, that's because we're going to be bringing in a lot of those values of like collective access that the cultural center leaders will be uh, taking on, you know, trying to make the space as accessible as possible, but still at every moment of every program, there's going to need to be some collaboration where it's also happening in the community. Uh, we need to know that as people enter the space, they are agreeing to think about certain access principles to make sure that others can come and enter the space safely. And we're going to have to really grapple with the competing access needs of, of our diverse um, community, making sure that everybody finds some way to be able to participate in our, pro in our hybrid programs. Um, we've heard a lot about masking, uh, a lot. We, we did a specific focus group thinking about people who are physically isolating, who are immunocompromised, and are really hoping to see us have a, a, a rigorous masking policy in place. We've also heard from members of um, deaf community, for example, where there's concern about masking being really alienating and cutting off access to language. Um, we are, that's an example of something that we're getting into the nitty gritty and trying to think through what that's gonna look like. Um, similarly, we are grounding our work in disability justice, uh, and yet we know that it's part of a building that we don't have full control over and that there will be security cameras and we're really working with that building to think through all of those policies and what that is going to look like. Uh, and also working with our staff so that everybody will be trained in various de-escalation procedures and um, uh, having some very clear internal policies about what happens to support people and the many sort of um, things that somebody might be dealing with while in our space. Um, we're exploring like, well, what does it look like when it is such a small, it is a small space. We'll, we'll say that pretty honestly. Um, you know, I think that when we, in 2018, we were out there and collecting, Longmore was out there collecting feedback from the community. At that point, it was like, dream big, dream big. And now we know what the space is and it's, it's not huge, but it's so central and there's so much opportunity and to have disability housing on top of it is so exciting. So we just feel really confident about what we're gonna be able to do with the smaller space by making it you know, kind of experimental and changing from day to day what, how the space is utilized. Um, but that means we have some, some kind of tough questions of like, can anybody just come in and spend the day in the space? Or do we have certain times of day where it's open for that sort of just hang out and utilize it and other things that are by reservation? We're, we're kind of thinking all of that through as well. Um, and also uh, we have heard many times people looking for representation, wanting to know that you know our programs and who's gonna be leading the workshops and the, the programs that we're, we're running who's on our advisory council. And of course our staffing itself is prioritizing um, a, a disabled leadership, uh, which is incredibly important. Uh, something that we are uh, aiming for in, in all of our programs. Um, our advisory council is still underway. We are about halfway there. We, I see a couple advisory council members um, here. So thank you for being here. I won't out you just yet, but I'm happy that you're with us. And um, in our advisory council, we're really thinking through not just um, uh, disability representation, but all of those marginalized communities that we mentioned in the focus groups, we're trying to make sure that we have uh, representation from those groups on our council as well, so that we are really letting this be led by people who have the most lived experience in some of the communities in San Francisco that we're going to do some extra effort to pull in and have them be part of our program. I have a little image on this slide, which is from Alice uh, Wong, Sandy Ho, and Mia Mingus. Their collaboration, Access is Love, um, and the heart in love, the O in love is a heart. Um, and that's just to say that we are really grateful for and think about that philosophy of the work. Uh, so even in all these messy, hardest places that our, our planning is at for just like, what is this really going to look like? And how is it going to, think about um, being led by 
uh, a, a grassroots approach to disability uh, and community. Um, you know, we're really making sure that everybody felt, feels very cared for in this space and, and we're very excited about that opportunity. So um, we will begin in July. Um, so the way this is gonna work is there will be a full year of just virtual launch um, to the cultural center. And then we will go into a brick and mortar as soon as the building is, is ready for us. And when the brick and mortar opens, we will continue hybrid. We're really grateful and excited for the opportunity to start with virtual programming. Too often virtual can, when you're doing both, can kind of be the afterthought. So I think it's really a, a very important opportunity to start with a year of virtual to establish that uh, that community as as so central to what our work is going to be about and, and not an afterthought to the, the in-person space. Um, so we'll be kicking off Disability Pride Month this July with a few different programs. Um, first, we're going to have, well, I'm saying we don't have an order yet. We don't have dates yet. <laughs> um, we just have commitments that this is our plan. Um, we're going to have a dance slash crip fashion party that's just going to be really celebratory and joyful and if crip fashion to you is like your sweatpants and you're lying in your bed or if it's that you want to pull an evening gown out that you haven't had a chance to wear because it still doesn't feel safe outside because it's still a pandemic like whatever that is we we're going to encourage you to have a lot of fun and get to show it off we're going to make it accessible with audio describer um, and it's going to be a really fun interactive event um, we are going to do a collaboration with the Disability Visibility Project and Alice Wong for the 10 year anniversary of DVP. And we're very excited about that. We're going to hear from Alice about what does disability culture look like today. And we're going to hear from some of the people who that project has impacted. And with Alice as a San Franciscan, this feels like a very exciting way to um, kick off some of that. Um, sort of speaker series that we'll be doing moving forward. We're gonna have a night of talent. Uh, that'll be a mixture of spoken word, some comedy, some drag, some crip hop. Leroy, I see you on, I'm gonna send you an email about that. Um, and just a really fun example of like celebrating the rich like community of performance and uh, creativity that we have. Um, we are, I wrote like a choose your own adventure virtual space. And that just means that we heard a lot of people who want some kind of just like more casual opportunity to hang out with other people virtually. And it might be that you're working on something and you kind of need some accountability to say like, hey, I'm working on this hard thing. I'm just gonna be working on it for the next hour. And a couple of people can cheer you on and say, yeah, go, go, go. Or maybe you're just gonna do the dishes and you're gonna talk to some folks. Um, we'll work out what that looks like, but we just heard a strong desire for something that isn't an intense program. It's just like hanging. Um, and Superfest will be from uh, this year co-run with the Cultural Center uh, and the Longmore Institute. And so we're gonna start that off by having a um, virtual festival that'll celebrate some of our family from friendly films and that can pull in folks who wanna bring better storytelling of disability to your family communities. So that's just like what we're thinking for July and early August, and um, but also gives a range of the types of programs that we see coming moving forward. Okay, so thank you for letting us um, talk a lot there at you uh, when we, we really wanna be in dialogue with you. So at this point, we have two different ways that you can jump in and join the conversation. We've already been getting some Q&A in the Q&A box, and we'll get to some of those and answer them live and talk more. Uh, so if you have any questions, you have two options. You can write them in the Q&A for us, or you can use the raise hand function, and we will promote you to panelists and give you the option to sign or speak. So um, with that, Let's see, I had seen Orchid had, yes, thank you. I had seen that Orchid had her hand up. I'm gonna call, but now it's down. So Orchid, if you'd like to talk, please raise your hand again. And I see you, Penny, and I'm gonna promote you to panelist and allow you to talk. Hi, Penny, thanks for being with us today. And we're gonna ask that people keep it to roughly two minutes. We're gonna time it, we're saying roughly because of course, we know there's a number of 
very good reasons why two is hard for um, accommodation. So if you need a little longer, but I will kind of prompt you when two minutes is up. Go ahead, Penny, I asked you there. to unmute. Yes. Yeah, okay, there we go. Great. Okay. Um, my question that I haven't heard much on, although I'm sure some people are thinking about it, has to do with chemical sensitivity and environmental access. And of course, with a new building, that's a nightmare for many people. And I'm wondering about the con consulting and use of safer building products. Um, I know that was a big issue when the um, Ed Roberts campus was built. And then, uh, and, and so there's going to be issues about building materials, there's going to be issues about outgassing everything from, you know, carpets to anything. And then as that gets better, and with certain things being done right, it'll get better sooner. Um, what kind of fragrance policy are you going to have, um, which is probably just as controversial as masking or at least it's up there. Um, but there's different levels of how much control you have over how your laundry gets done, for example, and with what products. But people can make choices about whether they use scented hair products or perfumes or makeups or gels or whatever. Um, and I've certainly worked with groups where people have said, well, my culture is not being represented here. And if it's, if I'm not getting to use this hair gel, it's not being respected. In the past, we've had those fights. So I'm wondering how much of that has been talked about and what that's going to look like. Thanks so much for your question. And it is something we've had conversations about um, conversations, for example, with the design team um, and talking to the sorry. <laughs> um, talking to the architects. And um, I know we won't have full control over every aspect of the space as as renters in the space, um, but we are talking to make sure that we use um, not just the most sustainable, but um, the but construction materials that are less harmful. Um, as part of what we're doing. And um, we're still, as Emily said, in the, in the midst of developing all the policies and it will be really essential to have our advisory council weigh in on some of these questions, but absolutely share your concern around sense, even just personally, um, and definitely at the very least encouraging folks um, coming to events, um, not to wear these scented products. Emily, did you have something to add? No, yeah, just it, thank you. I mean, I think you you captured the compl complexities of it and it, it's absolutely something that we've both heard from some of the community work we've been doing and have been mindful of. And we've, we've shared, a, a we actually outsourced and got some specific recommendations um, from community and shared those with the architects. So we were able to give some really um, clear direction. And then also just kind of planning that all of the furnitures and, and things that are being built or and built and purchased are being purchased and built really early. Um, so that when we set when that launch date is, it's going to plan for that off gassing time. The one other thing I would add is just how uh, what you're articulating is also so crucial to why we're advocating for this space to have this indoor outdoor courtyard and feeling um, to also be able to kind of think, well, what happens when we have the policy, we've asked for it, and then two people are in a space and, and it doesn't work. And, and some of those reasons that I know I've dealt with in past events for why that can work can be disability reasons, those certain medications that I've had people say. Uh, the smell that's on me is my insulin or is, you know, something that is, is a medical need. Um, and so, so utilizing courtyard side rooms and trying to, to think through like what that will look like. So that again, that 
uh, it, it might not mean everybody can sit right next to each other, but everybody can hopefully still find some way to coexist in the space in a way that feels supportive and, and welcoming. Thank you, Penny. Um, so I'm going to ask Dagny to uh, share with us some questions from the Q&A box. Yeah, I'm happy to. Okay. Um, from Leroy Moore, congrats, Leroy, Leroy Moore. As Emily knows, I'm planning to create Crip Hop Institute. So cool. My question is, how would you outreach to people of color community? So happy for this. Thank you. Um, you can, I think Nico would be great. Yeah. I think part of the beauty of the um, people that we have on our team and the collaboration between the two organizations. We have um, a really diverse team, both in terms of disability and in terms of race and um, also, you know, experiences of those who haven't all, always felt belonging within um, disability community, right? And so that's really important for us that we take an intersectional approach that we gr be grounded in disability justice um, and that we, you know, for folks that don't yet have a sense of belonging or have felt comfortable with disability, that we also be a space for, for those folks as well. So I think that's where representation will be really important in our team on the advisory council. Um, that we're bringing together, um, and and who's leading the a lot of the different activities um, in the space. Thanks for your question. So, still don't see any raised hands, so we can keep going with the Q and A box questions. Amazing. Okay. Um, Emily, this is a great one for you. Will it be free to access the Disability Cultural Center? Yes. Oh, you can be an easy one. <laughs> yes. Um, our model is without a doubt that we understand that there are so many people in our community who are paying for so many extra expenses tied to living with the disability in the capitalist system. Um, we will have all of our programming be free or sliding scale. Um, and sliding scale starting at zero. Uh, and the only um, exceptions, well, they'll still be sliding scale, but things like renting to use the sort of side conference room and things like that for your community work or community organizing, that will definitely be sliding scale. So we'll have a more limited number available um, for different income uh, to be able to, to support um, that being used for sure for free and also um, potentially generating a little revenue to keep the center going. Next question. Yes. All right. So from M. Elo, I can't speak or sign. Could you read my question? I would love to see programs that are asynchronous. My chronic condition often makes me miss scheduled events and there's never alternative modes of participation. Emily. Yeah, so it's, um, Definitely a plan for the majority of the stuff that we do to um, be sharing it on YouTube afterwards um, so that anybody can watch asynchronously. There'll be a few exceptions to that. Um, programs like Cafe Crip that will be leaving Longmore and switching over to the Cultural Center where it's really important that anybody feels the safety of being able to speak more freely and not have a recording be permanently online uh, in those rare, rare circumstances we would not be recording but the goal will be that uh, there will be a lot of opportunities to um, watch asynchronously and also that there are you know disability cultural center discord and and places where asynchronous community building and dialogue can also be possible um so that there's still that what did you think what did you like what did you do that happens thank you um okay this one is from Leroy again uh, I love this question is there a chance down the road to own the building mm -hmm. um Bruce Wolf says community land trust Mika what do you say 
I would, you know, absolutely love that, that option. I think, um, you know, where we have restrictions as of now and what we're able to do and the financing piece of it, but I think we should dream and think about how that could become a possibility in the future. Okay. Um, all right, this is from Lampert Hoodie. Please, will there be at least a little thank you incentive for the moment today? Uh, so we um, are doing what we can with our resources and we chose to compensate people who participated in the focus groups. Um, that was an hour of time and like a lot more engaged questions that we were kind of pushing on folks. Uh, and today we are not offering any compensation for being here, uh, but we are offering gratitude. I know that doesn't feed bellies, but um, we do appreciate that people gave up an hour, hour and a half at the end of their day um, to, to be with us. Thank you. Okay. And um, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Isla Shrek says, are there ways to get more involved in the planning process or to participate in events and in events as a performer, et cetera? Either one of you would be great with that. <laughs> Maybe Mika. <laughs> um, yeah, we're actually, um, um, we will be sending out a survey at the end of this because we do want to hear broadly from all of you, your, your questions, your hopes and dreams. So there will be more ways to engage. And um, once we, you know, we really want a model that's not volunteer based so that where folks in our community are compensated for their, the work that, that, that they're doing. Um, but as we go forward, we're really excited to collaborate with individuals, organizations, um, and, um, yeah, to to offer some of of the incredible cultural programming that we've heard from folks so far, and um, will continue to do so. Emily, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, just yeah, let we're we're here for it. we're we very much hope that people will not be shy about self promoting and and getting it out there, and and there will be a lot of efforts as we get closer to the to launching the virtual programming to hear from all of you and, and kind of collect uh, information about what sorts of things people want to be a part of. And part of that will be for our programs and part of that will be that we hope we can also do some matchmaking because and, and be a resource for other folks that say, you know, oh, my kid's school wants some uh, to do something for Disability Awareness Week and they want a few speakers that we can know who's out there. Um, and and you know, that referral work being part of our, our sort of hub approach to what we want this center to be. Um, I'm just going to read a comment um, from Court R. When I went to an accessible park for people with disabilities, the bathroom with the changing table had an electric Hoyer lift attached to the ceiling too. It was so cool. And hopefully the indoor spaces will prioritize ventilation and maybe even have a few HEPA filters. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, Steve K has a question. Um, and uh, Steve says, when you draft the center's budget, what fraction of funding do you envision will come from the city of SF versus fundraising from other sources? Emily. <laughs> um, well, I, and we are very grateful that the city is really investing in, in starting up this project. Um, so for the majority of the contract, the space, the programs, like we, there was a significant uh, investment for, to cover the first three and a half years of this, this project. Um, we need to make sure and learn from the city's other cultural centers that like just because we have that city funding start, that we don't assume that that's always going to be there, especially in San Francisco, where city budget is, is always fluctuating. Um, and um, so we need to make efforts to fundraise and, and start building up that fundraising. Um, and even as it is right now, for example, we have put 
in and, and are really fighting for that folding door that Mac Dagny mentioned. Um, and that's not in the budget. So uh, that's that's 80,000 that we are going to be trying to raise pretty pretty soon. Um, so, you know, if you know anybody, everybody out there, uh, <laughs> you, you know how to reach us for that. Um, but yes, there will be a, a, a mixture um, with for the first few years, uh, I, I, I won't say like a percentage for you, Steve, I'm, I'm dodging it, but um, <laughs> you know, the majority, uh, a, a comfy majority is thanks to our generous support from uh, the Department of Disability and Aging Services. Do we have any hand raised or do you want to keep yeah, If anybody wants to ask a question live or just share a comment live, you're welcome to do that raise hand function and we'll give you the ability to come on screen and, and unmute. Um, we have a couple fun comments coming in. This is from Islet Shrek again. Also, this is so exciting and refreshing to be in a space that's already thinking about the things I have to think about to access a space. Yes, that's our goal. And please always let us know if there's more we could be doing. All right. Um, Liz Henry said, I'm excited about getting uh, to find out about everyone's art, music, performance, writing of all kinds of culture and creative activity and activism. And I'm definitely going to show up as a poet maker hacker. Mm. Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> um, all right, Court R says, I'm curious if any contract or internship positions will be open for disabled people who would love to be part about what will happen at this institute. Personally, I was interested in the Emerge Fellowship, but did not go through with it as I didn't think I was the type of disabled person who was being sought after. I still like what's being done here though, and truly believe I could contribute. Oh, Court, that's awesome. Um, Mika loves talking about internships. <laughs> right. So yeah, we will, especially once um, we have the brick and mortar location finished, we'll be having several different positions. One will be um, an ambassador of the space. Um, and we're hoping to hire from Kelsey residents who live in the space who could be caretakers of it. Um, we also have a youth leadership program um, for disabled youth um, who will um, be paid to help us um, bring their different ideas and learn from each other um, as, um, as part of an internship program. Thank you, Mika. And we have someone with a raised hand. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Disability activism SF. Like it. So you've been promoted to panelists and now you just need to unmute. There we go. Uh oh. Change the name. Hi, can you uh can all hear me hopefully? Yes. Thank you. Um, so, uh, first I just want to say that I, I had written an email in, um, today is, as you all might know, is an election day. Um, it's very challenging with my disabilities getting to the polls. I actually just got back and I think this meeting's about to end. I had to rush back here. Um, I just wanted to ask if y'all would please, please consider doing one of these on a day that's not an election day. Um, I think you'll get a much bigger turnout with more, um, disabled people that aren't having to juggle such a difficult task. Um, and then um, I just wanted to um, say I'm really excited, of course, for the Cultural Center. It's it's something we've all been waiting for years. And um, the inclusion of art and, and ways for our community to share music and poetry and illustration and painting, it's, it's so important, especially as disabled people are, you know, I feel like we're being erased from the culture and from society as eugenics uh, culture is strengthened and, and has become much worse. Um, so I think it's so important that we're gonna have this space. Um, I wanted to just advocate for two small things. Uh, one, 
The first is to have the easiest process possible to sign up and display artwork or performances. One of the ways that disabled people are excluded most is through bureaucracy and red tape and barriers to entry, you know? Um, and so making those barriers as small as possible so that we can have voices heard from a diverse community, um, not just the very few percentage of disabled people that are employed, but for most of us that are not employed, many that are unhoused, all have voices to share. And the second point, um, which I have mentioned in meetings in the past, is to please, 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 please make comfortable furniture, cushions, couches, pillows, bead pillows, things that are not hostile architecture, things that welcome our bodies, which are in pain, you know, which have sores and bruises and, you know, chronic pain and back pain. You know, when architecture is hard plastic, you know, it doesn't welcome our bodies. And so I just wanted to really emphasize that point. And I think there's ways to do it, you know, even if it means putting plastic over the, over the pillows or whatever, you know, but just soft, you know, something soft. That's for my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you for the feedback on election day. Um, this is just one of many pieces of, of collecting community feedback including a survey that will be going out, the focus groups we've been doing, and also, you know, there's a commitment that we've made to, to doing um, town halls as part of the annual process of the cultural center. Um, so we know there'll be a lot of opportunities for, for more dialogue and we will uh, make sure to, to think about election days moving forward. Um, and thank you for the feedback of the furniture. Yes, it is, it is something we have heard from so many people of just that comfort of like, if you, um, uh, don't feel that your body's being treated well, why would you leave your home? Um, so um, we are really imagining a, a mixture of different furniture while still needing to kind of work in this very challengingly small space where all that furniture has to go somewhere. So we're, we're getting creative. The ideas of like pillows and things that can be added on and supplement our, is, is right in track with what we've been talking about. So grateful to, um, to hear your, your feedback. Thank you so much for, for being with us. I'm gonna go back to the chat for a minute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so from Leroy Moore, there should be a book about your process to bring this forward to the community because most of the times these centers are only on campuses. And Liz says, Leroy, maybe you should write that book. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sounds great. Uh, and also just fun fact, this is the first municipal disability cultural center that uh, we've been able to find. So yes. Um, yeah, someone should tell us really early if we're wrong about that. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've done enough research that we're just claiming it, but uh, I think it's true and even as you say, Leroy, when we've been talking to people about it, we've realized that some have come in with the assumption that this is inside of a, of a university. We kind of had to say, I think I'm making things complicated being part of it as, as, as having some of the connection be from university. But yeah, I think it's really valuable and important that it's separate. Um, Bruce Wolf says, apologies for arriving late. Perhaps you already covered this. Who and what will be the rest of the building above the ground floor? I think a few people came in late. So, um, Nika, do you want to talk about the Kelsey a little bit? Yeah. So, we'll be the, um, the operators on the ground floor, and there will be other community space on the ground floor. And then I believe it is 112 units of housing that will be above us, and there'll be studios and two bedrooms. Um, mixed income, I believe, from 20% to 80% AMI, um, really disability forward. And we're not um, in charge of the process, but there will be a lottery open soon for the housing piece of it. Um, Jennifer Walsh wonders, uh, would there be opportunities uh, to vent about ableism moments? Emily, would you like to talk about that? <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's super important from what we've heard of like, 
Well, one, that anything that's that kind of situation, making sure that it's led by somebody who's a member of that group. We heard a lot of people who are saying, you know, some of the support groups are read, led by an outsider of the community. And no, that that very much would not be how we would do things. We, we get the importance of like being in a space where you just get to like have that shared recognition of like, oh, this stuff we're dealing with and let that disability rage come out. It's super important <laughs> um, or, and solidarity and, and all of that. Um, so I think that, that that sounds along the line of what we have been thinking for what Cafe Crip will do, what some of those just like communal hangout spaces will do. And it doesn't have to be kind of structured and somebody facilitating it, but just like that that's the goal of like this being a space that you're hopefully entering a place where other people will get it. And maybe not all the exact same experiences, but um, enough overlap to find some, some some good supporters and listeners and um, community members to to grow and restore um, from from those awful experiences that oh are hopefully not happen happening there. Um, we have a few people with raised hands. I'm gonna um, I think since we've we're starting to see duplicate comments in the Q and A, we can do duplicate comments from our um, folks who would like to uh, come and come off mute. So Penny. Hi, can you hear me? Awesome. Um, I kind of wanted to piggyback a little bit about the comments about really super comfort, cushy, nice for painful bodies. And, uh, but I also, and I don't know what would be possible in this area, but has anybody communicated with uh, people uh, who are in charge of BART? Um, because the the civic center station while very central is a really i find a very difficult place to navigate with the disability the elevators tend to not be clean and the um elevators are broken half the time not half the time but a lot of the time and and there it, it's it's I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I find getting around in there confusing. And I'm wondering if there's anything that can be done with BART to make the station more disability friendly as opposed to, well, yeah, it's accessible. What more do you want? You know, I was wondering if there was any plan to reach out to them or any hope for any kind of I think reaching out is a great idea. I mean, I think whenever you have the numbers of like, we are bringing this many folks to this area every day, it allows mm -hmm. for greater advocacy and would welcome the chance to support that. Um, I also think it's part of the, you know, I, I, it hesitant to make, hesitate to make commitments on the spot, but like our, our hope of the type of leadership that we're able to offer is those updates, like that, mm -hmm. you know, we are knowing from the start of the day, like, oh man, the elevator's down again. Make sure, you know, that we, that you know where to check us, check our center and we can give those updates to people um, to be showing that, that aspect of like care and understanding all of what it means to come to our center and not just like, why don't we see you there? But understanding how many hurdles are in, in the way. So um, I appreciate it, Penny, thank you. Um, and we had another hand raised from Zach. Do you still want to yes. come in? Okay. Hi, thank you. Um, so two, two things. One, I think I heard someone say that the housing will be available at 20% AMI, which is area median income. Is that correct? So we are not in charge of the housing at all. It's the Kelsey Civic Center will be managing that. And I believe that they the way they're doing it is a mixture of AMI. So it goes from 20% up to 80%. And, um, and I also think 20% of the units are being reserved for disabled people. And um, they are not allowed to do more than that uh, because they could have a reverse discrimination claim on their hands, but they are uh, certainly building the units to be accessible so that any any unit could be uh, so there's there's a hope um, that 
I have a hope that we can spread the word very strongly in the community and see much more than 20% of the housing go to disabled people. Well, I, I want to, thanks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, if it's, I want to be clear on this though. This is a very important point that's lost in our community very often. And that is that area median income is not based on the income that disabled people receive. 20% of area median income in San Francisco, according to the 2023 HUD Metro Fair Market Rental Area uh, is $20,150 for one wow. person. That is wow. more than all, almost all disabled people can afford that are on any kind of uh, government assistance. The government assistance for Social Security Disability pays a maximum usually of around $1,000 a month, 1500 a month. So even if you don't buy food or clothes or anything else, you cannot make that rent. And so that's why I'm really curious to know if any housing will be available for the vast majority of the disabled who do not have employment because of the discrimination we face and cannot afford 20% AMI. And so I, I ask that, you know, if you have any info on that, that would be really helpful. And if that is the case and it is 20% AMI, please make it clear what the dollar amount is so that disabled people do not get their hopes up and get misled into thinking that, oh, I'm on social security. I can find housing now when yeah. really you can't, you know? Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll happily relay that to the Kelsey. Um, uh, the Kelsey Civic Center is um, has a number of members on their team who are disabled people who um, have experience with fighting for housing um, and come at this from a disability housing justice perspective. Um, so uh, we'll make sure that they hear that there was this concern um, and uh, I'm sure they'll be checking out the video from this today. Thank okay, you. yeah, just just to finish, like the, the concern yeah. is not disability access, right? It's it's the economic situation of the disabled. Understood, understood. And the, the, the last thing I just wanted to say, which is separate, is that I would love to see some severely disabled people uh, making some of the decisions in this cultural center and being in some leadership positions. It's very common that jobs are given in the disabled community to those of us that are not severely disabled, that can work full time. And there are actually a lot of us who are severely disabled, who would love to have more input in our community, who would actually be leaders in how to design a center for all disabled people, especially severely disabled people. And so if there's any opportunities for uh, for that, and I think promoting those positions, right? Promoting people with severe physical disabilities to be in leadership roles, even if they can't work full time, is a hugely important part um, of our community that I think is often missing. So I just wanna highlight that and also would love any information that you get um, for you know, any kind of volunteer, you know, paid, you know, uh, surveys, those kind of things um, with, with notice. Cause last time Longmore did a paid survey, they only gave us 24 hours notice. A lot of people didn't know about it. So like with a week or two, I'm on the Longmore email list. Mm -hmm. It would be great to get notice like with a week or two advance, like there's a paid survey. There's a yeah, way I you can ask you to, move, to, to cut it. Cause we said, we're going to ask people to try and keep it to two minutes. Um, I appreciate the, the feedback, feedback you're raising. Um, it's, it's very important. Um, yeah, we, we, we know we want to make sure that concept of, of who is guiding the work of the center is the people whom we most hope to serve. And so the, the concern you're raising is, is very important, like that, that leadership opportunity, we are very much uh, thinking about that with the advisory opportunity we're bringing together, the advisory council that we're bringing together and with the future hiring that we'll be able to do down the road um, to, to try to do outreach. And also even in the way we created these positions, uh, we did think about like that, that full-time wasn't always desirable. That I, I know from my work at Longmore, we had some part-time positions uh, open recently and I could not believe how incredibly uh, qualified the applicant pool was. And it was because there are so few disability friendly, supportive places to work that are part-time or lower 
Um, and even our own staffing model um, of, of Dagny and Mika and I, like we're not full time because of wanting to build a staff model that doesn't burn people out and that recognizes disability needs in the work week and the way, way it's structured. So I, I really resonate with what you're raising and I think it's, it's very valuable. And uh, I put travel. the um, the link in the chat to the um, to the project by the Kelsey and at the bottom there are fact sheets with more specific information on the housing. I'm seeing a lot more questions have come into the Q&A too. Yeah. Um, so we had Helen Solminski ask who will be in charge of the housing piece and the lottery who's running that thanks. So I think we answered that by saying that is all the Kelsey and you can get more information with the link that Mika just put in the chat. Um, Jennifer Walsh wants to know how does the library work? Um, I, I can tell if yeah. you want. Um, we, um, we are definitely thinking about access. Um, we've already met with the public library and have uh, the, the talking books um, section of the library to learn about how we can have some accessible audiobooks available for people who are blind, low vision, or who have learning disabilities that benefit from hearing um, uh, audibly. Um, and we see a lot of books that can be used in, and um, used in the space. Uh, we don't foresee having the ability to like lend our books and, and send them home with folks. Um, but we also are uh, developing ideas of how to work with the public library, which is just so close. Um, so that's a real opportunity uh, with some of the things that our smaller space cannot do or some of the stuff we don't have technology wise that the public library just has some pretty amazing disability resources. Um, so really developing partnerships to extend what we can do, um, including, you know, having a conversation with the public library or we already had a conversation with the public library about making sure that we um, have a, a exciting disability studies collection there and disability justice um, books uh, so that we can maybe the things we can't check out can be checked out there. Thank you. Okay, Leroy Moore, would you work with Disability Justice Cultural House in Oakland? I hope so. <laughs> Yes. Um, okay, we have a couple repeat questions from Bruce Wolf that I'm- uh, We're gonna pause yeah. real quick for um, access. I got a note that the cart is behind. And we will make sure to slow our pace a little bit. Okay, thank you. Are we good? Okay. Um, so Bruce Wolf had a few questions we've answered, but we could just go over them quickly again. Who will manage programming? Mika, you want to talk about that one? Can you make one more pause, Mika? We're still a little bit of a lag on our cart. So there it goes. It just reloaded. Okay, we're good. All right. So yeah, we will we will be um, managing program with input from today, from the focus groups that we've been holding um, from our advisory council. And yeah, we're really excited to launch the virtual um, part of programming in July. Okay, and will meeting and or community space be publicly available? Yes. Um, and then Emily, do you wanna talk about this one? Will there be a community-led decision-making or steering committee? Maybe go a little bit more into the advisory council. Yeah, um, I'd be happy to share. We are creating an advisory council. Um, we are anticipating eight members, possible we'll have nine or 10, but around eight members. Um, and we have been meeting with um, various leaders in the community and 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 doing a lot of outreach to figure out and make invitations to folks who we know have expertise at supporting um, these sorts of projects and thinking about disability culture, while also uh, coming from diverse backgrounds that can uh, do much more than what our staff is gonna bring to the table. Um, so we're really thinking about 
bringing together a group that will uh, represent the various focus group areas that we are particularly excited to do outreach to pull into the center. Um, so that involves um, BIPOC, LGBTQIA, uh, unhoused or formerly unhoused, somebody who's physically isolated uh, right now, somebody whose systems impacted, whether that be foster care, youth or um, uh, former foster care or uh, incarcerated or medically institutionalized. Um, and veterans and transitioned aged youth. Um, and that's not, I mean, it's some people will check a few of those boxes and also many people will check many of those boxes. It's not like we're thinking we'll have one BIPOC person and one, um, it's, it's just that we wanna make sure that these are groups inside of disability population that sometimes don't get heard from or centered. Um, and so we know that we'll benefit a lot from that expertise and um, are really grateful to the people who've said yes so far and are hoping that we'll have our full group soon to announce because we know we're going to really need to um, get some some great advice from this this community who will be able to extend our, our thinking and our ideas and our um, our outreach. And we also hope that there'll be other opportunities too. I mean, that's sort of the core one that we're developing right now. But for some of our biggest programs inside, we also hope that we can develop smaller committees. So for example, with Superfest, um, we'll have a committee of uh, jurors that will be 100% disabled jurors. And that's another opportunity for um, uh, participation. There'll be other little smaller opportunities as well. And Bruce asked that question, who's a former juror and a former advisor for phase one of this project when, when uh, the strategic plan was happening. So thank you, Bruce, for your former uh, work in this area. Um, I, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Jennifer Walsh says, how about GGRC? We have a meeting with them. Um, it's been uh, scheduled, I think it's very soon. Um, we've week. already met with a few others from GGRC, and that's another example of the type of um, organization that we've been kind of doing this very busy couple of months is just working our way around and making sure we're not uh, reinventing the wheel. If people are already offering it, then our job is just to make sure that we're rooting people in the right direction. Um, that's not right. Sending people in the right direction. Uh, <laughs> And um, and then also learning from these organizations, like where the opportunity is. Um, okay, so we have a couple more comments I can read out, but we are not having any more questions. So I'll read Ray Lanzarotti says, thank you for all the efforts to plan, build and launch, appreciating the program ideas too. Um, and Ryan ooh, Dinsden says, my power soccer team vents about ableism over dinner after games sometimes. Games sometimes. It's cathartic. Um, and Island Shrek says, a direct transit program to and from the center would be amazing. That's usually my biggest uh, access barrier. And then Disability Activism SF says, really excited we can have comfy cushions and furniture, less office chairs, please. They always block wheelchairs. So I think we might wait for another minute to see if we have any other questions pop up. Oh, Zach has another question. Yeah, uh, go for it. I think you should still have the ability to unmute. Oh no, he thinks he's not a panelist anymore. Oh, let me get you back up there. Sorry. Yeah. I'm not in the alphabetical order. One sec.
there. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, we can hear you. Hello, you can hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. No, no worries. Um, yeah, just a follow up kind of from an earlier question. Does anyone, I know it might be too early for this, but does anyone know uh, what the process would be for doing a poetry reading or showing art in the space? Hmm. We are working on it. We, we definitely, we, we just had a meeting with the LGBT center and, and they were talking about having a community, um, a small community group that, that chooses the art so that people can kind of from, you know, put forward their, their art and that it, um, it's selected by community members. Um, and then a lot of the, the other types of programs will just be kind of led by, we're hearing from community, we want a poetry night, you know, who's out there. And um, I spoke about this earlier, I'm not sure if you're on yet, but that one of the things that'll happen pretty early on uh, as we're getting ready to launch it, once we've got our systems in place, we're going to, to put a big sort of like, welcome to the DCC, you know, join our system. Uh, that sounds scary. Hopefully it's not. <laughs> um, and it, it's really a chance to collect that information of what people have out there. Like what, you know, who wants to, who does poetry, who runs a small business, who, uh, likes to go to kids' schools and teach about disability, whatever that stuff is to really collect that so that we then are planning a poetry night. And we're again, first and foremost, thinking like who in the Bay area, who is disabled, like can be, you know, at the center of these programs. Um, so there will be, yeah, we don't have, we don't have intake forms yet or things like that, but we are definitely doing the planning to make sure that there are opportunities for us to not just use the same folks that we know, but make new relationships. And I, can see I that say just a brief follow-up to that same topic, or should I wait in line for the next? We have two more hands raised. So if okay. you can do a 30 second follow-up, that'd be fine, but otherwise we'll go to the others. And if we have time, come back. Very quick. Yeah. 30 seconds. Easy. Uh, just, I want to advocate for an open mic and open art sharing, because I think all disabled people, I think all people are poets and artists. And a lot of times the difference is just having that opportunity for an open space. Um, so just Thank wanted you. to say that. Yeah, that's, that's great. We did hear that, but open mic, just open talent nights and that art opportunities for art that isn't just about hearing from the polished artists, but that you can just be in the space and work on your art and get help and brainstorm with other artists. Uh, that, that came up a lot. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you, you, you uh, say that as well. Um, Catherine, I am uh, giving you the ability to speak to now. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Can, yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to mention because the, the arts is coming up so much um, that I am aware of arts funding opportunities and I don't know if you would all meet certain eligibility requirements, but you could work towards them um, to, keep in, to keep in mind. I actually, as one of my docs, work for the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and we give money, that's pretty much what we do, including a grant that is specifically focused on, not our favorite word, but right now underrepresented is what's being used community, um, as well as some smaller uh, funding opportunities so that disabled artists could be paid as part of it. Um, I'm also willing, if you could share, or maybe it's already, uh, part of this event, but if there's a good email, I'd be happy to kind of offline sort of connect and see if there's anything I can offer to help support this work. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That is promising, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we know it's gonna be part of that work is fundraising, but it, I appreciate what you're bringing in here, which is that the fundraising is not just for ourselves, it's so that we can then be creating paid opportunities yeah. for the artists. Yeah. Which is really important. Um, yeah, we, we'll, we'll definitely be sharing our information, but my Emily at Disability Cultural Center, I'll, I'll be doing some of the lead work on, on fundraising. Um, so we have just a few more minutes. So Dagny, if you want to put that last slide up. Yeah. We can, you can close it out for us. All right, that sounds good. 
Um, where is it? Okay, so we had a question in the chat and here's the answer. <laughs> so um, what's next? Um, we have a survey that we'll be sending around. So if something came up and you didn't have a chance to say it or you have additional feedback, we would love to get your input. So we'll be sending that around. Um, disabilityculturalcenter.org is our very basic website right now. You can uh, follow us on Instagram and Disability Cultural Center is our handle and um, reach out to us directly at info at disabilityculturalcenter.org. We are still in the planning phases, so um, there won't be a lot of communication, but when there is, uh, if you go through these channels, you will be the first to know. And Emily just put the link to the survey in the chat. And we, yeah, love to hear more about your thoughts. Thank you all so much for spending this time with us. We are so grateful and we look forward to just so many more opportunities to have dialogue because that's core to what the center is gonna be all about. Thank you for your time with us this evening and thank you to our access team who helped make this event possible. Thanks y'all. Thanks. Take care. Have a good night.